letting it go. <laughs> okay, so today we're talking about biopolymers and natural polymers, and I got the screen working before you um, tell me. And so we're going to go over polymer basics first and look at uh, the terminology. Now, gosh, we're teaching the polymer course now. Have y'all had the polymer course? No? Okay. Um, I don't know how it's going to work into the curriculum, if it's going to be required or not, but we had to add that course as a part of the ACS certification. And so now we have a whole polymer course. So but anyway, we'll go over the polymer basics, the terminology. We'll get into biopolymers and talk about natural rubber, polysaccharides, and proteins. And then we'll talk about natural fibers like cellulosic fibers and protein fibers. The most common protein fiber we would have um, would be hair. Um, DNA obviously is a, is a polymer, but it's not really macroscopic like a fiber. So it would be one of the polymers as well. So here's the sort of a landscape of the polymers that we're going to talk about in this course in forensic chemistry. And we're over in the red box, the, the natural fibers and semi-synthetic fibers. And then we'll do synthetic organic fibers next time, and then we'll be done. Okay, so polymer terminology. You start out with just a simple uh, monomer. So this is, this is again, mono meaning one. So this unit, this mer, this is, is one unit. And typically they have in common this double bond. So that's the key right there. Whenever you see any organic molecule with a double bond, you can make a polymer out of it. And so that's why polymers are so incredibly diverse. And we'll get into the, um, when we get into the synthetic uh, polymers next time, we'll get into a lot more of the naming. Today, we're gonna to be talking mostly about the, the biopolymers and they have their own common names. You can have random polymerization. Now, what is this X and Y? Well. Look where the chlorine is. This is an asymmetric monomer. And so this may be the situation where the chlorine is facing forward, and then the Y might be where the chlorine is facing backwards. And so how this polymerizes could be random because there's really not much chemical difference between whether the chlorine is facing forward or chlorine is facing backwards. Or these could be two different kinds of molecules. Like you might have two types of monomers in the unit or in the pot, and then as they're as they're um, polymerizing, it may be random how they snap together. You can also do block polymers. Block is sometimes this is called copolymers. Where you grow uh, like a unit X for a while, and then you grow a unit Y for a while, and you do this in two different pots, and then you mix them together and they snap together. So you build the blocks separately. Why might you want that to, um, why would you do that? Well, because of mechanical properties. So this might be rigid and this might be flexible. And so you can finely tune the properties of the, the final product. If you want a really soft fiber, you want something flexible. If you want a, a, a fiber that's gonna give you more structure, you want a more rigid fiber. But if you make it too rigid, it becomes brittle and it snaps. So you can finally tune the properties of the polymers by changing the block lengths and their properties of the different blocks. You can take a long polymer and you can graft on polymers onto the side, especially if there's still double bonds in those monomers. And we'll see that in natural rubber. And then you have some polymers that by definition have to be alternating. And that's an example of nylon. So you have this diacid piece reacting with a diamine. And so in this case, the diacid and diamine alternate. So it's always X, Y, X, Y, X, Y as they go down the, down the chain. Now, you can have long chains of polymer that, that will uh, line up next to each other, just long linear polymers. You can have polymers that branch a lot. This is kind of a poor example of a branch polymer because it looks like all the branches come from this central piece where really there'd be branches coming off all of these edges you know it's not just like from one central spot where they branch they would branch off of the edges too we'll see some of these branches today in uh, glycogen and, and in starch another 
mechanical property of polymers uh, or, or how you fine tune mechanical properties is this cross linking. And so you've got this nice long chain here and then you've got these short connections. What that does is that that prevents these chains from slipping past each other. So if the chains can slip past each other, then they're flexible. You can bend the polymer and they can slide past. If you cross link those chains, then they can't slide past each other and you have a more rigid polymer. Again, if you cross link it too much, you make it too rigid, then it cracks. It doesn't take much to break a molecule because you think about those atoms that's uh, per mole, the bond energies are huge. You know, 300 joules or so per, for a mole of carbon-carbon bonds. If you just break one bond, you're taking that 300 uh, joules and dividing by Avogadro's number. So then we're talking about, you know, 10 of them, 10 of the minus 19 joules for a bond. That's, that's nothing. That is nothing. And so you break bonds all the time. You don't even know it. Okay. And so cross-linking, if you cross-link it, then you, you make it so rigid and, and then these, these, uh, these cracks develop and just rip through the material and you end up with a cracked uh, situation. These dendrimers, dendrites are, are branching, but from a central point. And so these would just keep branching. And they can make, have you ever seen a kush ball? Um, this was a good example years ago when those were more popular. It's just a little rubber ball with a, like a tiny core in the middle and then just a bunch of fuzz that sticks out. Like it's a super soft ball. And it's kind of what a dendrimer would make, would make like a koosh ball. So maybe I should get a picture of one and put it in the notes. Okay. What's interesting about this, and I think Dr. Petrakovics is uh, talking about a dendritic polymer for delivering her drugs, because this inside can have a different chemical environment than the outside. And so if you can make this small enough that it can be suspended in an aqueous solution, then you can have like a little fat micelle on the inside and aqueous on the outside. And you can put your little drug in here, your little fat soluble drug, and, and it can leak out. And so this is um, one, of the, one of the possible ways for drug delivery is use these dendritic polymers. Let's look at the cross-linking idea. This is the oldest way of cross-linking. They took natural rubber, mixed it with sulfur, heated it up, and the sulfur made these cross-links. And these disulfide bonds are also ways that a lot of your enzymes hold together. And so the structures of your enzymes will have these uh, disulfide bonds. And so if this is a, a natural polymer, let's say this is some enzyme, and it relies on these uh, disulfide bonds to give it structure, and you introduce a heavy metal, then that forms a precipitate with the sulfur. And so heavy metal poisoning is really, the reason it's toxic to our bodies is because of the heavy, the heavy metals, by definition, the toxic definition of a heavy metal is a metal that precipitates with sulfur. So you could look at those uh, solubility product constants and the KSP for, um, KSP for mercury sulfide, um, gosh, it's, it's ridiculous. I would I would say uh, my guess is something like ten to the minus forty nine. It's incredibly insoluble, and so if it makes that sort of permanent connection with sulfur, that can wreck your enzymes. And so heavy metal poisoning is uh, really destroying a lot of your enzyme function. Um, I'm going to say this is my my guess. You can look that up. If somebody has their phone and wants to look that up, that'd be great. Just curious. So you're looking for the KSP for um, mercury sulfide or KSP for sulfide compounds. Just let me know when we when you get it. Now let's talk about these physical properties of polymers, and this will lead to our demonstration. So let's think about this polymer phase because you're used to solid liquid gas, right? Your three phases. We get to polymers and we add a few more phases to our phase diagram. 
Now we'll start up at the top, you know about liquid. Now some polymers will have a melting point. If they're pseudo-crystalline polymers, let's look on the right. So pseudo-crystalline polymers, they will freeze. And so they become a solid that has what I'll call a short-term shape memory. They're a flexible thermoplastic for a while. And then you get below this crystallization temperature and the polymer starts to crystallize. Now this can happen slowly over time. And that's one thing that um, we like to um, prevent in a lot of our plastics. Uh, if that crystalline phase starts to grow, it, it'll start to crystallize and then that crystalline phase will start to grow. And a lot of times these crystalline phases are very rigid. Once again, we don't want rigid plastics necessarily because they crack. And this is the mechanism that causes our dashboards to crack. So over time, the dashboard polymers will start to align and they'll start to grow crystal phases. And it's as if you're making uh, like chunks of gravel held together by stretched plastic. And then the cracks will develop around the rigid regions. And so the crystalline region will grow and then that'll just start to crack. It'll pull so hard on those flexible regions that they'll start to split. A lot of times the crystalline phase is more dense. And so that's what creates the stress. It's called a stress crack. So the crystal starts to grow and it's pulling on those flexible phases and then they start to, to rip apart. Over here, this type of polymer, amorphous internal organization, doesn't really have a, a melting point. It just starts to turn to a gum. Okay, and that's why I'm chew chewing my gum. And the gum, this is nasty, I know, but there's no shape memory. I pull it and it stays stretched. It, it comes back just a little bit. And so it might have a tiny short-term memory. And so with, if I press on it, it stays pressed, just like the memory foam mattress. So the memory foam mattress is not really memory foam. It, it's, it's like short-term memory foam. <laughs> you press on it, and it remembers for a little bit that shape. And when we're talking about memory, we're talking about shape memory. So you push your hand into it. For a short term, it, 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 it holds that shape, but then eventually it, it puffs back out. Okay, and so what when we talk about shape memory, typically in po polymers, we talk about the, the memory of the shape. If I bend this polymer, it remembers that it should be straight and it pops straight really fast. So this is shape memory. That's not what the, they advertise for the memory foam mattress. So they're kind of poisoning your mind about what memory is. A polymer memory is like this. You straight, you, you insult it and it remembers what its original shape was. It'd be really crummy to have a, a, a tube that, that was like uh, the, the memory foam mattress, more like a gum, because it would stretch all the time. You try to run something through it at high pressure and it would just stretch out. And then you um, and then you relieve the pressure and it stays stretched out for a while and then slowly moves its way back. That's not very good memory. You want it to have you know long-term shape memory and remember its shape and go back to it quickly. So the, the mattress is more like a gum. It's kind of like you're sleeping on gum. Yeah, it sounds nasty. So it's not very good for marketing. <laughs> so they like the memory foam part. Now, there is a property of polymers that's important that you can actually use for, for I would say, an evidential thing. If you want to confirm that these polymers have the same properties, the glass transition temperature or the crystalline temperature would be some things that you could look at. So whenever we look and compare polymers, uh, a lot of times we're looking at aged polymers. If we start growing crystalline regions in there, we're going to change that um, that crystalline temperature or we're going to change that glass transition temperature. If you cross-link the polymer, you're going to change the glass transition temperature. If you break those cross-links by age or, or uh, you know some sort of environmental situation, you're going to shift that glass transition temperature. So if I have a piece of question material, <coughs> like evidence, and I have, uh, you know, I'm going to compare that to a polymer, say, found in a suspect's home or something. The glass transition temperature should match if they're from the same source in a short amount of time. So there's glass transition temperatures don't change uh, rapidly. They're, they're sort of a fixed property of that polymer for uh, a period of time. Maybe over time, years, they might change. They might shift a little bit, but in the in the short period of time that glass transition temperature should be something that's 
that's fixed. So what do we mean by glass? We go from a rubber phase to a glass phase when we go past that um, glass transition temperature. And it's really going from flexibility, something that can be moved or, or bent, to something that has a fixed shape. So a really long-term uh, shape memory. It's a fixed shape, just like a glass. So we've got this. I'm going to lower the temperature of this flexible Tigon tubing. And we'll see that it will shift into a glass phase. This is kind of too, fun too. So let me try and get this on the video. Turn my finger like this. Okay, I'm having to have a full screen video. Okay. Now, when you have a, a percolating coffee pot. You know that it pumps the liquid up by forming a bubble in the bottom of the tube and then the tube blows the liquid up uh, the bubble in the tube blows the liquid out the top and that same thing happens here but you say wait a, a coffee pot is boiling well this is like um 72 kelvin it's really cold let's see i've forgotten the boiling point of liquid nitrogen i think it might be 72 kelvin can you look that up for me philip <laughs> liquid nitrogen boiling point yeah, but anyway, it's cold. 333 below zero Fahrenheit. Okay, that's cold. All right, so when I stick this room temperature tube in there, it's going to be boiling, and it'll pump liquid out the top. So watch the top. Isn't that kind of cool? <laughs> so that's uh, it's like a percolator. I don't know if I saw that on the video. Yeah, you can see it shooting out the top. So, And so we're getting liquid nitrogen on the tile. Um, so it's the little um, droplets that are hitting a room temperature tile too and they're boiling as well. You can get it in your hand as long as you don't cup your hand. You, it'll boil off your skin. So like it, anybody want to do that? You can kind of feel it hitting your hand. If, it, if you cup your hand, it'll, it'll, it feels like you're getting bit. Anybody want to do that? <laughs> you can hit. Yeah. So you don't want it to have it in your hand for a long time because it's going to make your hand 300 and something below zero. So let's go ahead and freeze this thing. Okay. You can see it on the desk too. Okay, so this polymer now is way below its glass transition temperature. Okay, let's see, I can see. See that spot right there. Let me just get this over. I used to have two gloves. I don't know what happened to this one. <laughs> so I'm going to hit it right here. Okay. So this is a glass, right? You can... It's supposed to break. <laughs> it's a pretty thick tube. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Bust the board. Williams, what did you do? <laughs> you got to get a good grip. That's why I have the glove. <laughs> did I get you? <laughs> Where'd it go? Here's a piece. No, don't don't grab it. Like, I mean, like, um, <laughs> see? Yeah. So it's like it's in its glass transition temperature now. When it warms up, it goes back to the rubber. It goes back above, and so that's the fun part is you get to take some of this home. <laughs> so you get a little piece there. See it shattered just like a glass. You can hear it. Tink, tink, tink. Yeah. There's a split all the way down. I should have gotten some thinner tubing and it makes it more dramatic because there's lots of little pieces. So that's that's the glass transition temperature. So naturally, if you get some polymer below its glass transition temperature, it's going to be very brittle. And if it's a thin polymer, then it's going to break very easily. So now you know a little bit about memory foam, gum and rubber. The gum is gum and rubber. Phases, the main difference is the, their ability to hold their shape.
for a long period of time. If it's a rubber, it's going to hold its shape longer. A uh, gum is like gum. Just think of bubble gum. Okay. Which I can probably spit out now, so I don't look like a cow. Really. I made a stupid mistake one time. They said, let's freeze uh, freeze uh, blueberries, you know, and they make these really hard marbles, right? <laughs> and uh, you, you're supposed to let them warm up, and then you can eat them because they're like really cold, but I didn't let it warm up long enough. And I, I like tried to touch it, and it touched my lip and it stuck to my lip, just like the whole like stick your tongue to the frozen pole. Yeah, so I had to just let it freeze my lip. I wasn't going to like rip my lip off, but I had a blister. So dumb. Okay. <laughs> I won't tell you how old it was. That's right. It just now healed. No. <laughs> okay, so natural rubber. Um, this is the isoprene monomer. Okay. And this, this is this, uh, a component of the sap of a lot of different kinds of trees, but the natural, you know, the rubber tree, you can. You can make a cut in the bark. You don't go all the way around. If you ring the bark, then you'll kill the tree. So you cut part of the bark. You put this little style in. You can go to see the Hunger Games and see what a style is. And uh, you can get that, that latex out. And they, these little pots on all these trees are collecting that latex. And now this is the, um, I guess, the old school name for latex. Latex paint now, the latex part just means water soluble. So. Uh, but the, the original latex was, you know, this, this plant material, and that's, we still call it that. So latex is kind of an ambiguous word. Are you talking about water-soluble paint, or are you talking about the, the milky substance that comes out of plants? Okay, so you have to clarify, what are we talking about when we talk about latex? And, and so in this case, it's the milky substance that comes out of the rubber tree, and it has these uh, isoprene monomers that can be polymerized. And so you can polymerize them and make natural rubber, and then you can mix in uh, sulfur and you can vulcanize it and make these cross links. And then that makes that, that natural rubber uh, more, you know, more rigid. So you've experienced natural rubber and maybe you've experienced these kinds of boots. They have a, a good shape to them. They're pretty rigid, they protect your feet. Um, natural rubber you've seen in latex gloves and so that's where the latex for latex gloves comes from, um, but also rubber bands. So again, something extremely inexpensive. It's just straight out of the tree. They polymerize it and they, you know, you see how flexible it is and so on. But it is a rubber. It's not a gum. It has its, its shape memory. That's why you stretch it and it wants to pull back. So the, a, a gum band wouldn't be very good. A rubber band's okay, but a gum band, you know, you pull it out and it stays. It's not going to be very good. Then we get into other biopolymers, so polysaccharides. So this is in the in the group of carbohydrates. And so think about carbohydrates. This structure is exactly what the name says. It's a carbo and a water, so a carbohydrate. All of them have this base molecular structure. But notice, <laughs> as a chemist, okay, the molecular formula, that's the empirical formula. It doesn't tell you much, does it? And think of all of the different kinds of ways you could put the, those three units together. And you see in all of these different saccharides, you see this unit. That's the carbohydrate right there, the carbon and the H2O. And you just you make all kinds of, of different substances with that base molecular structure. Now, when you go from the, the sort of expanded into the, the ring system, you can have a different rotation of this piece here. This, this is the important piece, this anomeric carbon, and is important for determining be between something that might be a sugar or a starch or a cellulose. They'll have the same, it's like 90% the same structure, but you flip that carbon and all of a sudden your body can metabolize it or not. Or you can get long polymers or you get these coiling structures. And, and just changing that one structure and how it, how it closes uh, means enormous, makes enormous difference in its uh, physical properties and in its chemistry. We're not going to go through every little detail on, on these polysaccharides, but I'll hit some of the highlights. Uh, the other thing, too, is, uh, is 
you can then react with all of these OH groups and we'll see how some of these OH groups, if we react with amines and other kinds of things, we can get uh, different structures. Um, we also don't talk much about the synthesis of these because a lot of these are done in in the living systems with enzymes. So they're enzyme mediated. When we get to the natural, I mean, we get to the synthetic polymers, then we'll get into condensation reactions, free radical uh, polymerization and, and um, those kinds of uh, polymerization structures and, and reaction mechanisms. But in here, most of these are enzyme mediated. Now, different views, you'll see different things like the Fisher projection or the Hayworth projection. And, and you can kind of see this rotation that I was talking about and how it, how it forms that reaction and closes the ring. It can give you a, a, a different structure. And it can produce this where, like this situation where you have all of the OH groups are on the equator, or if you had closed that ring with a different uh, rotation, then now you have one of the OH groups on, on the axial position. So these right here, let me just sort of circle them here. These are equatorial. And then this one's axial, and it makes a huge difference. And just think about that. If, you know, if I'm linking, let's say I'm making a one for connection. So I'm connecting this carbon one on this unit to four on that unit by reacting these two OH groups. Then these rings are kind of in the same plane. Not exactly, but they're going along in the same plane. If I do that only with this, this one, look how it's going down. Now I've got a bent structure and I can make a, a circular structure or a linear structure. And it's exactly the same chemistry, but you've got completely different physical properties. The, um, the chemistry of carbohydrates is just absolutely fascinating. And I uh, heard a great talk in one of the ACS traveling speakers and his whole career was in, was in uh, carbohydrate chemistry. It was just amazing. So you have this, uh, again, this is the example with the equatorial OH groups, a one, four prime linkage. You can also link the, the one to the three or to the two or to the six. You can have all these different kinds of bonds. Here's one where you've got that axial carbon um, going, or an axial hy uh, hydroxide group going down. There's some other kinds of, uh, of structures. You've heard of maltose. If you're looking at some of your sweeteners, you can get that from starch. So if you break down starch, you end up with maltose and also sucralose. So there's your artificial sweetener. They've taken these basic uh, sugar structures and they've added in some chlorine bonds, okay? And there's your low calorie part because the chlorine bond is an energetic bond to break. If, you got, if your body's gonna have to break that down, um, either it doesn't metabolize it at all and you just pee it out, or if it does metabolize it, you're you're ruining the energetics. And so if you ruin those energetics, then you're not getting energy out of this molecule. Uh, you're using energy to break it down. And so how would we classify these biopolymers? Well, you, you know about DNA. That's definitely DNA evidence, and that's a classification of its own. You have proteins, and then you have the polysaccharides. And under polysaccharides, you have starch and cellulose. And then starch, you have glycogen, which is how we store our energy, amylose and amylopectin. And then under cellulose, you have cellulose-related substances. Um, <laughs> I heard a, also another great talk. It said the, the talk was plants don't poop, okay? And if you think about it, plants don't poop. They, they take everything that they make, their cellulose and so on, and all of their waste products are, are somehow incorporated into the plant. So everything that they make, they pretty much hold on to. And so they may make cellulose, and then you have all of these other substances that branch off the cellulose path, like the hemicellulose, lignans, pectins, and, and alcohols. Now, they emit a lot of stuff. They emit uh, oxygen. Thank goodness for that. And they also emit uh, all these, um, like in this case, conifer alcohols. Uh, we 
are absolutely in the Sam Houston forest. We, we are just completely bombarded with organic molecules all the time. Even when the pollen is gone, <laughs> I can't wait for that. Um, we are completely bombarded with the, the, the gaseous, the small molecules that do come out of the trees and, and plants around us. So I guess that may, may not, maybe they don't poop, but they do breathe. <laughs> and they give us lots of alcohols and lots of these alpha pinenes and so on. And we can actually measure it in my lab, in the cleaning lab. So if we clean a metal surface and we get it down to the bare metal oxide, we don't really take it down to the bare metal unless we scratch it. But if we just clean it down to the clean surface, a metal oxide surface, we can put water on that surface and that water will spread out, okay? Because it's a high energy surface. And so the water will spread out because even though water has a high surface tension, it's, it's, a, it's lower energy than the metal surface. So it'll coat it spontaneously because nature wants to go to the lowest energy possible. But if uh, some of these pining molecules land on that surface first, they will lower the surface energy below water's surface energy. So then water won't spread. And so you can sit here and look at the metal surface. You can do a contact angle and get like a, I think the lowest we ever got in our lab was 20 degrees contact angle. So you would, um, you would see at time zero, you would see a 20 degree contact angle. So this would be 20 degrees. Okay. And then we would see, we did this over about 30 minutes or so, so 15 minutes. That contact angle had jumped up to like 30 degrees. That's not a very good 30 degrees, but, and then uh, 30 minutes. We're at 40 degrees. That's an incredible change in contact angle. What we're measuring is sub monolayer contamination on the surface. And all those alcohols in the air from the plants are landing on that surface and quote, making it dirty. The reason I know that this was a really, this stuck out in my mind was because it was really frustrating. The people that had us doing this cleanliness study said, you have to clean it to 20 degrees contact angle before you start the experiment. And we could get to 20, but it wouldn't stay there for more than, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes because we have so much contamination in the air. Where were they? Why, why were they able to maintain uh, a 20 degree contact angle for a long period of time? Because they're in the panhandle of Texas where there aren't any plants. <laughs> there's a little bit of grass, but that's it. There's, there's nothing in their air. And so anyway, uh, these are the cellulose related compounds that come out of the plants. So let's get back to the polymers. So we have chitin. And I've added a few little comments at the top. This is like nature's armor or chain mail. This is the exoskeleton of insects and arthropods. So we start with that cellulosic backbone and then add in some of these, uh, these amines here. So we have an amine piece and this sort of acid, uh, you know, acetic acid piece. So acetylated amines stuck on there. And, and so you have this glucose piece and this amine piece and you have the glucosamines, okay? So if you're taking that as a vitamin supplement, this is what you're eating. You could also eat the exoskeleton of insects if you wanted, but that glucosamine tablet sounds a lot better. <laughs> okay. It's this inter, uh, you know, intermolecular, no, intramolecular hydrogen bonding that really provides that rigid structure. So the more structure you can add to your polymer, the, again, the more rigid it will become. Now, this is a fantastic, this hydrogen bonding piece, let's go ahead and highlight that. That is such a great thing for armor or chain mail because it, it, it breaks, but then reforms. Wouldn't it be nice if you broke a covalent bond, if it could reform right away? What have you done? You've absorbed that energy and then you've allowed it to be distributed over the molecule and then you can repair it like it repairs itself. So if we could have a polymer that had covalent bonds and hydrogen bonds, we'd have a perfect type of polymer because it could take an insult. It could break a lot of those hydrogen bonds, maybe a few covalent bonds, but the hydrogen bonds absorb that energy. Then it gets distributed over um, 
you know, over time, they form slowly, they get back to, they sort of repair themselves over time. So it's a polymer that repairs itself. Uh, it doesn't repair the covalent bonds typically, but it will repair, it, it, when I say repair, it changes its shape and, and then it can repair and, and get back to its original shape. Starch, this is nature's way of storing energy. And so these little hexagonal units are all of our little uh, starch molecules, or sugar type molecules. And then we have like, if it's linear, we might make a bunch of those one four prime uh, bonds, but then we could branch off at a one six prime. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> if we have long chains, then, and we wanna recover that energy, we have limited amounts of places. So if, if the body's going to recover that energy, it, it does it one unit at a time. It's, it's kind of like storing energy in a bucket. You only have access to the top of the bucket. And so storing energy on these long chains, you only have access to the ends of the chains. And so you'll pull energy off those chains, off that stored energy from the ends. So if you want efficient energy storage and rapid recovery, you want a branched, a highly branched, like in glycogen, it's highly branched. You see how many ends we have? We have so many more ends. And so we have access to more energy rapidly. Now, why do seeds have a lot of starch in them? Things like potatoes and other kinds of seeds, bean seeds, acorns and all of that. That's the, that's the energy storage for when that seed needs to grow. So when it starts, all you need is water really to get the process going and then that starch gets converted into energy so that it can grow out the roots and grow out the first few leaves. Once it gets those leaves above ground, then the sun can start supplying energy. But until it gets the sun, it has to use the starch to, to get the energy. And the same with your uh, trees. Uh, through the winter time, they lose their leaves they, when they start to, um, in the, in the fall, they start really storing that energy in their root system. And so in the spring, they start using the starch that they've stored in their roots to push out those leaves. Once they get the leaves pushed out, then the sun can provide the energy from that point forward. So, uh, don't ever, I mean, again, you, your trees may survive, but don't ever trim your trees after they've pushed out that first bit of spring growth. A lot of times I've done that because I forget to trim my trees in February. And you want to trim them while they're dormant because all their energy is down in the root system. So you can cut off the limbs and then they can use that starch in the root system to push out the new leaves. If they used up all of their energy reserves and pushed out those leaves and then you chop off their solar cells, <laughs> they've got no reserves and they've got no leaves and you've got a real problem. So that's plant science. Now, nature's skeleton would be this lignocellulose complex or, or wood. So you take those cellulose fibers and you put them into a larger matrix. And then you, you know, you can have uh, channels for water and so on. Uh, you have these alcohols and so on that allow these layers to slip past each other. So you have natural, uh, natural plasticizers to keep the polymers uh, flexible. And, uh, and you can create this, this very complex structure we call wood. Uh, these, here's some pictures of the conifer alcohols and the lignans. All of these things um, can be squeezed out of the plant and that's called tall oil. <clears throat> we'll talk about the paper pulping process in a little bit, but tall oil is a byproduct of, of of uh, paper uh, processing. That's important to my work because again, they're trying to find out, there's a ton of compounds in there. So taking tall oil and extracting those compounds, it's a, it's a wonderful source of some uh, really complex organic molecules. Let's do a quick top hat for, we'll just do an attendance thing. <clears throat> Gotta make sure I get my coffee and not the liquid nitrogen. 
there's a great video from the 50s of this guy. He has liquid oxygen in a door and, and he pretends to drink it. Okay. He just fills his mouth with pure oxygen. And then he's, he's like a, it's like the fifties. He comes home from a hard day at work and he's smoking a cigarette, right? He pours himself a drink of liquid oxygen. He like takes a breath of it and he, he blows through the cigarette and it looks like a blowtorch. There's this blue flame coming out of the cigarette and it's burning like super fast, no smoke. It's, it's Google it. It's or on YouTube. It's hilarious. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. It's such a, it's so, such a 50s vibe too. So it's pretty funny, 50s or 60s. Anyone left in here that's trying to get in? Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, so this is, this is just a, a side note here. Um, sometimes they can add things to to uh, natural fibers like cotton to give it other properties. Now, this is not a, a chemical additive. It's more of a physical additive. They're not making a, a, a chemical bond to the uh, cellulosic fibers, uh, but they're mixing in clay. So they'll take cotton fiber and they'll, they'll mix it in with a ultra fine clay um, that will that will heat up and create a, a barrier. So this is um, sort of an important process for for fireproofing clothing. And there's some requirements on, on uh, like baby's clothing and so on to have this fire resistant nature. And this is how they do that. They'll mix in clay with those fibers. We can use the, the OH group here and we can react with that. So you know that from organic that the OH, the, the hydroxyl group is such a reactive group and you can do all kinds of chemistry with it. One of those things is to react it with the chloride and you react it with a chloride, you produce HCl, put that in a basic solution to pull that, that acid out of there, and you can, you can make this covalent bond. And so like if this is a triazine dye, something kind of like an azo dye, but it's a triazine, uh, then you can, if you put a chloride on there, if you can get, get this reactive organic chloride, then you can react it with any of the cellulosic fibers and you can make a chemically fixed dye. And so that's uh, something that's not going to fade with the uh, washing because you're not washing the dye out. It's actually covalently bonded to the cellulose. Uh, this is a really interesting reaction. And in this case, the reactants equals the product. So this is really weird. You take cellulose, that OH group, and react it with carbon disulfide. So these are the reactants in cellulose with this CS2 reaction. And look at the products. So we end up with the same product. We have the cellulose at the beginning and we have the cellulose at the end. And so that's kind of strange. Why would that be useful? Why would we go through this process? Well, if we want to make long fibers, spinning that cellulose into long fibers, this is the old way of doing it. And this is the new way of doing it. So we can make longer, more entangled fibers that are stronger. But it's the same material though. So we can take that cellulose, react it with carbon disulfide to make this cellulate, cellulose xanthate or viscose. Then we can extrude this into solution. So we're making our new fibers. <clears throat> it's a way to get cellulosic material to be soluble. So we can make an organic solution of it, spray it or extrude it through these fibrils and make long, long, long entangled chains of these polymeric molecules. And then we can pull that CS2 off of it and make it insoluble again. <clears throat> here's a picture of a natural fiber and a semi-synthetic fiber. So here's the, the you know, cotton fibers off the plant under polarized light microscopy. And you can look at how coily and kinky they are, okay? And difficult to manage. You know, trying to spin that into um, uh, polymeric fiber, I mean, you might have a really soft fiber because it's hard to get these things to go straight. If you react it with acetylation, again, you could take those OH groups and react it with acetic anhydride and, and make acetylation. Then you can make these cellulose acetate fibers. And so that would be a semi-synthetic fiber. So if you were to look at these two things under, say, an infrared uh, an FTIR, 
they would it'd be hard to tell them a diff, a tell them apart okay you might from the acetylation see a carbonyl and so that would be your clue that that you've got uh, you know some acetyl groups some some carbonyls on them but you know they're going to be very very similar so chemically you can't really tell the difference but physically the the straightness of the fiber the luster of the fiber its behavior under cross polarization you know physically those are going to be something that you can really determine um, as being different let's talk about paper so basically we want to make wood flat so we can draw on it you take the wood or um, soft or hard, make the wood chips. So you chip it up and, and you can feed in recycled paper products and that's called brown stock. And again, it's brown because of that tall oil. So you pulp it, you bleach it, react it with sulfuric acid. Uh, this produces a lot of um, SOX gas. So if you ever work in uh, on the East Coast or on the West Coast where the paper mills are, you will know it. <laughs> Growing up here in Texas, I knew what a refinery smelled like, you know, and I was like, okay, that's Texas, you know, gold. And you can, you know, you just know that that's that smell of the refinery. Up in Oregon, you know what a paper mill smells like. You're driving along, you're like, ooh, what's that sulfury smell? Well, it's a paper mill. And it's that sulfuric acid that they're reacting with this pulp and bleaching it out. Then you process it and make it into paper. So once it's in paper form, you've got lots of voids, but again, the OH groups dominate the chemistry. So we, we, um, you know, we have uh, inks and, and pigments and things like that, that, that will interact with the OH. They're attracted to the paper. Water is obviously attracted to the paper. So we use paper for absorption, but also it's fairly rough. And so if we just take a, you know, a solid that's, that's um, I would say, not a very strong solid, okay? Something that is uh, uh, easily broken. So if we, have, if we have a solid that just has lots of little planar pieces in it, and we rub that on something that's rough, some of those planar pieces will get stuck on this rough surface. And this is graphite. And you rub it on that rough surface of paper and the graphite breaks apart and that's what a pencil is we call it pencil lead but it's obviously not lead it's graphite it's carbon okay and graphite sheets are very easy to separate and so it's not a very hard substance i mean just take your pencil lead and scrape it with your fingernail you almost don't even feel any kind of force and you're scraping it apart so it's a very soft solid and uh, and you just rub it on this rough paper and you leave graphite behind and that's how your pencil works these pores again you've got cellulose in, in this whole material and it's super attracted to water so. now we have multi-component fibers so like that cellulose acetate we can make those fibers the semi-synthetic fibers and we can uh, dissolve them in solution and we can extrude them through uh, various uh, discs. Have you ever seen a sausage grinder? Like you put the meat in and you turn the little auger bit and there's a screen on the front and the sausage or the ground beef gets pushed through that screen. Same thing for these fibers. So you can take, um, and, and you can maybe have a pretty complicated set of auger bits. Maybe you have a substance one going through um, the outer part of this fiber. So substance one is, is coming uh, feeding to the outer part of that screen and substance two is extruding from the middle. So one and two, and you can have a multi-component fiber with your company name here, or your letter representing your company in the middle of the fiber. Now that's, that's, that's golden for, for evidence, right? <laughs> you cut that fiber, look at it under the microscope, you see an S in the cross section of the fiber. You're like, wow, that's, that is perfect. That's a lot better for evidence than just this, you know, this boring little pattern here. But even then, multi-component fibers, uh, sheath and core type fibers, these are complex synthetic 
fiber shapes. Uh, fiber uh, cross sections, how about that? And I'm putting complex in quotes, okay? Because that's like really, really complex for industry to do. It's a real pain to do that. But again, it's that sort of, maybe they have different strengths. Maybe you're producing a fiber that just has the right uh, properties that you want. Uh, why would we care so much about the properties of the fibers? Well, think of carpet. I mean, you walk barefoot on carpet, it has a different feel. And you may want it to have the perfect whatever feel. And so the company's going to put a lot of effort into its carpet fibers to give it the feel and the strength that they want. So this is complex for industry. And this is what nature does. Comparing the cross section of a hair to the cross section of what nature does, I mean, what, what, what industry can do. There's no contest. Nature is, is so much more advanced because it's building its fiber molecule at a time. Whereas industry is just taking this vat of polymer A and this vat of polymer B, putting it through two screws and running it through the sausage grinder and putting out fibers. Whereas plants and, and, and our, our hair follicles and so on and animals are producing those hair fibers, one cell, one molecule at a time. It's just growing this thing out and it's incredibly complex, which means every kind of animal or every kind of plant is gonna have a different kind of fiber because it's gonna have a different kind of process making it. They'll have similar properties. They'll have a medulla, they'll have a cortex, they'll have a cuticle, but you can really tell the difference between the different kinds of hair fibers. So if you do get a cross section or a microscopic image of a natural fiber, it's gonna be pretty obvious compared to uh, an industrially you know, synthetic fiber. So here from the Olympus microscope galleries, they change their website too frequently. So I tried both these links, they don't work, but you can go to Olympus microscope and somewhere on there, they're gonna have their galleries. I looked yesterday, I just couldn't find where they moved them to. Okay, but here's some different fibers that you can see under cross polarized light. Here's silk, here's cotton. I don't know what cupramonium is, uh, flax, um, you know, nylon fiber. Some of these are synthetic. Here's hemp and, and bast. Um, but then let's look at the hairs. So here's the hairs. Uh, here on a badger hair, you can really see the cuticle. You can see the roughness on the cuticle. You can see the medulla, this dark region in the middle is the medulla. Um, on alpaca, you can see, again, those dark spots in the medulla in the middle. You have the cortex in between that and the cuticle. So we're really mostly with this um, transmission illumination, we're really just capturing different images of the medulla, the filling of that hair fiber. Uh, you know, look at angora rabbit, how, how cellular the medulla is and how regular it is. Antelope hair doesn't appear to have a medulla at all or anything opaque in the medulla. It has a medulla, but you don't see anything opaque there. But you really see the cuticle and maybe even some of the cortex. Um, here's cat hair and this particular cat, is, the medulla is completely opaque and regular. Not cellular at all, you can't tell very much. Um, Civet, I don't know if that's two hairs side by side. I bet it is, because that, anyway, not exactly sure on that one. And then deer, you see, you, you see contrast with the uh, with the cuticle. So, I mean, my goodness, you can tell the difference between a beaver, a bat, and a badger. <laughs> so that's evidentially that's fantastic, you know. And hair is one of the biggest forensic indicators. I remember uh, the tour of the FBI years ago uh, in DC, they have a little tour you can go through. You see all of the, I've mentioned the, their little library of typewriters, you know, they had a wall of all their typewriters. Well, they had the, the, I guess I'll call it the shakeout room. You, you have these hangers up there and they have this huge polymer, uh, 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 Teflon co coated table that's white and they would beat the clothing over this table and all the hair, and carpet fibers and dirt and everything would fall out of that clothing on that table. 
and then they could gather it together and that was evidence. So it was really, really cool to see. So that's uh, your biologically uh, produced fibers. And next we'll talk about the uh, industrially produced fibers.